On February 10th, activist and educator Angela Davis paid a visit to the Wilmington Public Library as part of its Living Legends series. The author graced the room with her experiences and wisdom on topics of civil rights, gender equality, capitalism, along with many other topics. History is not changed by great individuals. When when, when we, we see the, 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 the most phenomenal transformations of history, they come as a consequence of large numbers of people embracing a collective vision. It is possible to be critical and at the same time to recognize uh, there is something that we have to hold on to if we want to imagine a future in which the needs of human beings are attended to, a future in which capitalism doesn't destroy this planet. Hi, Hi, this is Dr. Dr. Pam Greer, and I, I hope, hope to see you February 23rd at 6 o'clock for the 100th birthday of the Delaware Library, and I'm going to be honored for the Living Legends Legend series. series. See, see you then, we're going to have a lot of juicy stuff, stuff to talk about. Oh, oh it's, it's going to be hot, hot juice. juice. Bye. Hello, Hello Wilmington. Wilmington. I'm, I'm singing, singing a song right now. Can't get out of You may know me from my song. For you, I give a lifetime of stability. All I do is just for you. Well, well first, first, I'd like to wish the Wilmington Public Library a very happy 100th birthday. I want, I want you, though, to come, come out and join, join me at the Wilmington Public Library in Wilmington, Delaware, for their Dancing, Dancing with the Stars 100th Anniversary Gala on Friday, March the 4th at 6 p.m. All you have to do, register for the event below. Okay? okay? I'll, I'll see, see you there. What about you, sir? Do you think Everybody, welcome. I'm glad you're here. Was anybody here? Was anybody here last week? Would anybody like to tell me something that you, you took away from our talk last week? Um, Angela Davis said that we only know her because other people spoke her name and other people did things for her. So if it wasn't for other people and for the community, then we wouldn't know her at all. You can select a signed copy of one of the Car Sellers books. Okay. Anybody else? One of my um, greatest takeaways was that she talked about how what she did, she did not do alone. That it was a collective um, effort of the community and community organization, and that was really big for me. So, yeah. And could somebody tell us something, tell us anything that you know about uh, Mr. Ernest Green and the Little Rock Nine? <laughs> oh, I didn't need the mic, um, but I know that they were one of the first classes of color people that went to the elementary school. Um, it was a consist of nine people, and they were. It was terrible, but. Yeah. Okay. Like a, um, okay. Anybody on this side of the room? I'm sorry. We have enough discrimination <laughs> and inequality nowadays. The one thing that I, that I took away is the fact that um, after Brown versus Board of Education was why it was so momentum why they took that stand and why you know it was so important for those nine to actually stand up and the one thing i took from it is that his courage what a great courage they had because they were young people 
And basically they were in there alone, even though they had the National Guard with them, they didn't really protect them because they didn't intervene. So that's the one thing that I'm, I'm very interested in knowing what made him do it and what made him stay there. Can anybody tell me the name of the teacher that, that led and mentored the, the students and helped them? Anybody know? Initials are D, B. Yes. Do you like, you know for that answer, I'm going to give you both of these. <laughs> and they're signed? Okay, well, you all know who are, we have two distinguished guests here. We're going to have a moderated conversation with our living legend, Mr. Ernest Green. Uh, he'll be having a conversation with a CNN commentator, a social activist, Mr. Bakari Sellers. Mr. Bakari Sellers uh, worked for uh, Senator Ted Cruz. <laughs> and <laughs> and Bakari needs a lot of prayers. He thinks that he thinks that um, that 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 you should that chicken pairs perfectly with grits. So um, so I'd like to welcome Mr. Bakari Sellers and Mr. Ernest Green. Welcome. Oh, you should always be careful when there's somebody who has the mic after you, right? <laughs> Mr. Green. Mr. Sellers. So we were, ch we were chatting it up upstairs. Uh, my name is Bakari Sellers. I'm from the big city of Denmark, South Carolina, where we have three whole stoplights and a blinking light. And my mom and dad would always tell me the two most important words in the English language were the words, thank you. And they're not nearly said enough. And so uh, down south, uh, Delaware is not the south, but down south, we, uh, and sugar does go in grits, just a FYI, randomly, since we want to get off on this foot, okay? <laughs> uh, we always like to say we, we want to give people their flowers while they are living. And so, Mr. Green, I just wanted to start off by saying thank you for everything you've done for all of us. Thank you. You, you know, Bakari, uh, Wilmington, Wilmington is one of the district cases that led up to Brown. So I always feel the attachment to Wilmington. And then there's another Little Rock, Arkansas connection. The principal of uh, Dunbar, which was the Black High School, uh, was also on uh, principal of a couple of schools here, uh, Leroy Christoph. If uh, I see a few nods, so because the, the Brown decision depended upon the suit that was filed here, South Carolina, Topeka, Kansas. Um, I feel a real connection between Wilmington and we, the Little Rock Nine, and it's a pleasure to be here this evening. You know, I was actually going to, they were telling, yeah, there you, I was actually going to, to talk about uh, the Little Rock Nine and what led up to them. Uh, the first case that was filed in the landmark collection of cases known as Brown was in 1949 in Little Clarendon County, South Carolina, it was known as Briggs v. Elliott. Uh, and then you had the case here in Wilmington. But what do you remember most about that time? And let me ask you a very big question. I'm going to channel my inner Don Lemon here. Um, how far have we come since that time? Well, I think we haven't come as far as we should have. <laughs> and. Uh, I remember a comment from an old friend of mine. He said that we're involved in a marathon, not a sprint. And that anybody who thought that, you know, the Brown decision was going to wrap the world in a neat little box, 
that ain't the way it goes. And that uh, between, and for me, it was a belief that I passed this school every day. I mean, those of you who lived in southern communities, you knew that the big school was the one that white kids went to. They had physics and chemistry and courses that were going to give them the future. And, you know, we had like 12 vials of uh, chemical that had to be shared around with 25 students. So that my view was that it was about uh, uh, making available resources. It's always been our struggle about resources. And that I thought that the Brown decision made a lot of sense. I didn't see how it was going to be implemented. <laughs> and I don't think anybody else in many communities. Uh, but to illustrate the irrationality of both racism, segregation, putting people on the back of the bus, um, all of that piled up. So when the decision came down in 50, in uh, 54, and I looked at the Arkansas newspaper, it said that the Brown decision was going to change face of the South forever. It ain't do that. Well, it didn't change the face forever, but it certainly was enough of an opening for me to question, you know, what is it? What is it going to do? What, what, what is it, why is it worth going over to that other school, which I passed every day because we were in the same neighborhood? <laughs> Let me ask you this. And to give folks some context of the Brown decision, and we know the rancor of the Supreme Court and the dichotomy of the left versus right, six versus three Supreme Court now, Chief Justice Warren at the time got a very rare unanimous opinion on this issue. And so when you talk about the politics of then, and you know, you, you overlay that deep, dark, visceral racism that you had then, how does it compare to the politics of today? Well, there's, there's a, lot, a lot of similarity between today and then. <laughs> And part of it is that uh, these communities won't give up, uh, you know, their racist behavior. Uh, we, we watched the, the woman who was a speed sk skater. Yeah. That was so out of character, but why? I mean, there probably are a lot of people who can skate fast. But they never had shot. They never were invited to a rink. Yeah, Nobody yeah. Ever put <laughs> I've ice skated one time and I look like a baby giraffe. <laughs> hey, I went to college and took a PE course in ice skating. I couldn't skate any better. But I think it is because they don't want to give up their privilege. And it's a world that's shifting underneath them faster than they can, yeah. can move around. The browning of America. I know we went through that with Stephen Miller at all in the White House over the past four years. And the fear, the, the kind of, uh, I don't believe there's a such thing as economic anxiety. It's more cultural angst. People are afraid that the world is changing around them. Talk about the impact of your mother. Um, because in studying and reading about you, uh, that she seems to be the guiding light. Did she talk to you about civil rights? Did she, was she afraid for you? Because, you know, you, you had uh, other young men who uh, protested who ended up uh, in the bottom of the Mississippi. 
Um, so was she afraid for you? What was the role of your mother in this whole Well, I, I'm sure that uh, she was fearful. My mother was a school teacher. And um, she uh, uh, was able to, uh, in fact, she and my aunt and a, a group of other teachers um, helped bring a suit against the Little Rock School Board mm -hmm. for equal pay between black and white teachers. And every Southern community, I'm sure, had the same issue, that uh, they got paid three quarters or half of what white teachers got paid in Little Rock. But the important thing was that while this, the teacher who brought the suit as soon as she brought the suit, she was fired. The teachers banded together, and they pooled their money to support the teacher who got fired so that they could continue on with the, uh, with the court case. And I, I thought, you know, she never gave up her card in the NAACP. Mm -hmm. She always kept it up to date. Uh, when I came home and told her that I had signed this piece of paper to transfer to Central, she said, well, if that's what you want to do, I'm going to stand behind you. The, the, the strength of the nine of us really was a group of parents, guardians, adults who were willing to stand up and be counted. And because of them, we were able to believe that we had support. Now, my support ran all the way to a, a neighbor who said, I want to talk to you. You ought to go back to the, to the Horace Mann because you're going to go away to college somewhere and you're going to leave this mess for us to clean up. <laughs> well. <laughs> and uh, and uh, there's a certain practical application of that but you got to have soldiers who are willing to stand up and fight for change you, you, and 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 this movement as you know from your family and all was about people willing to take risks and stand up and be counted you know people sometimes they i think they underestimate the value of of those individuals and their family structures when they were involved in the movement and how it's almost passed down. My, my mother was a part of the desegregating class of Hamilton High School in Memphis, Tennessee. And of course, my father was one of the founding members of the small fledgling civil rights organization known as SNCC. And so it's amazing how those kind of familial uh, influences are passed down to their children and offspring like your mother. But your father, I read, and it's not a whole lot written, but was a quartermaster who was also very talented. What was his greatest influence on you as well? My dad fought in World War I. When he came back to Little Rock, he couldn't vote. Now, I didn't, yeah, World War I, I'm over here doing the math. I was born in 1984. <laughs> well, I, 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 I just passed my 80th birthday, so those of you... The, uh, uh, but my dad was a, uh, uh, a waiter, and he had station at the Little Rock Country Club. And in fact, if you really wanted a super party organized, you called up Ernest Green Sr. <laughs> and in this, I'm sure, a lot of folks in this audience uh, it was the family who had to do the work at the country club or at the golf course or somewhere. But he instilled in us that, you know, I don't want you to have to work at the golf course. I want you to stay in school and learn as much as you can. So we come out of a family where lawyers and 
doctors and professors and all of that. And, and that, that really is the face of, uh, of black folks in this country, that it's too bad that white people don't know as much about black people as black people had to know about white folks. Don't scare nobody in here now. They're going to start protesting outside in a minute. But, burning, but burning, I, I, burning I, I, books across the street. Yeah, well, they, those who want to burn books, they've been trying to do that for centuries, I suppose. And that the events, so you talked about uh, uh, Till. Uh, Emmett Till was my age. Mm -hmm. And he was like a lot of folks that come from Chicago and New York come south for the summer. You know, I've always, I, I think about that because people oftentimes want to question why are we talking about something in the past? And I'm like, well, my daddy went to segregated schools. In fact, Emmett Till and Joe Biden, like, the same age. You know, they're in the same cohort. I mean, this is not a very, very long time ago. But one of the unique things about the movement that I ascribe to is that I am a huge... People always ask me, you know, who is on my, who would be on my Mount, Mount, Mount Rushmore? Who did I study or who do I adore the most in the movement, which is a really awkward question. But nonetheless, I would always say number one and two were uh, Fannie Lou Hamer and Ella Baker. And those are always my one and two. But we did learn that the movement was spurred on by a lot of black women, including someone who's not talked about enough Daisy in Daisy Bates. Bates. So tell us, talk to us about Daisy Bates, because she deserves her flowers and she as much as we are in this month where they only teach us about Martin, Malcolm, and Rosa, we need to hear the names Daisy Bates more often. A absolutely. Da Daisy Bates was the president of the Arkansas NAACP. She and her husband, L.C., uh, published a weekly paper in Little Rock, the Arkansas State Press. And Daisy was always somebody who was willing to challenge the grain and she was uh, she was really our leader for the nine of us uh, we responded to her oversight Daisy was also somebody who had more inside connections than anybody you know politically yeah she knew when the army was coming in she she had uh, contacts with the Defense Department, she was able to uh, have an inside uh, connection with the, the uh, Dean of Boys, who was uh, J.O. Powell, was how we uh, were able to stay ahead of some of the violence that uh, uh, the opposition, the Neanderthals, wanted to put on us. And Daisy is, she represents to me uh, a face of lots of people. She's like Rosa Parks, but she didn't get the notoriety that Rosa Parks got. Uh, the movement wouldn't have gone, we, we wouldn't have survived that year without the help and the work of Daisy Bates. And uh, of the nine, I was the only one in the 12th grade, so I became the first graduate. I said, by default, you, you get that, that honor. But it was Daisy who stayed with us, who stayed behind us, who kept the information flow, and uh, she's another one of those faces. In fact, the civil rights movement ought to spend more time on the Daisy Bates of the world so that these young people will know that we had depth and we had talent. And that was why we survived this stuff with being able to go to the next level. Hey man of that, I, you, were, you, were, you were talking about Daisy Bates, but there's also people like Sarah Mae Fleming who sat down you know, a year before Rosa Parks did and laid the foundation for her, or George Elmore, who 
uh, who was one of the reasons that black folk could vote throughout the South in Elmore versus Rice. And so you have all of these people, the Jimmy Lee Jacksons of the world and the Megger Evers of the world, who we have to begin to talk more about. Um, whose idea was it? I mean, how y'all sitting around one day and somebody's like, let's go desegregate a school? Like, that ain't something that, that just comes up uh, in casual conversation. So, like, what were y'all talking about and whose idea was it to just run across the street and desegregate a school? Well, the Little Rock School Board, I think much like Wilmington, thought they were going to get in front of the problem uh, and the problem caught up with them. <laughs> um, it was all of our ideas. You, you pass the school every day. You play football in the stadium because they only had one stadium for a black school and white school. You had uh, folks like Orville Faubus who said that they would never, you know, allow black folks to go to Central. And once you had all of these resistors, it's like watching circus come down the street. You see all these balloons and the lions and tigers. Your curiosity ought to make you want to know what the hell is going on. <laughs> and the way I saw it, I passed the school every day. Everybody, the, the great lesson of life I learned was that everybody that told me they were going to be with me, when the moment of truth came, you're standing there by yourself. But I always couldn't figure out somebody's got to stand up for a change. It's not going to happen automatically. <laughs> Overfarbus is not going to call me up on the phone and say, will you please come to this school? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and and what, what, I, what I, again, go back to one of my earlier comments that of the nine of us, it was the families, it was the, the adults who said, if you want to do it and you believe in it, I'm going to stand with you. The funny part about that story is, and I, I get away with it, I think, because of kind of my, my father's legacy through the South, but I always tell folk that if you come down South and you ask 10 black folk, what they did in the movement, all 10 of them will tell you how they marched with King, but less than one of them was actually there. <laughs> you know, we, we, uh, I was reading one of the more uh, interesting autobiographies. It was this Condoleezza Rice, because she's from Birmingham, Alabama, rooted in the Baptist church, and her family despised Dr. King. It all makes sense now. Dr. King coming through coming through the city like a lot of black folk then. So the resistance that you felt leads me to my next question. After you entered the hallways of this school, you were a part of the Little Rock Nine. How were you looked at? Were you looked at as being this outside agitator, this rebel rouser, or did doors magnificently open? Were you looked at with adoration? What, what was it being a member of the Little Rock Nine, and how has it maybe changed? Well, I had a... I had some supporters, black supporters that were my age, that finally said, you know, if you go to that school, I'm going to support you. Uh, I may not like it. I don't understand it. I don't know why you want to leave us and go over there where these other people are that that may not want you at all. <laughs> and we came to an agreement that uh, I would hang out at that school, but on the weekends, they would be my release. And that's how we survived it. Um, it was, for some black people, it was, uh, 
it was difficult for him because you had to challenge authority. You had to challenge the, you know, the power system. And you had to be willing to be counted. You couldn't hide out, as you said. If everybody who had marched with Dr. King, you know, you wouldn't have been able to have seen Dr. King. I mean, uh, everybody who claims they did. But it's like Daisy Bates. When King came to Little Rock the night of my graduation, I'm sure the Little Rock Police Department didn't know who Martin Luther King was. If they had, they, would have, they wouldn't have let him into the room. Yeah. And that all of that makes me believe that we had a little divine status. It was because other folks were willing to support us and uh, help us along the way. It's like when we had an incident about a white student uh, deciding he was going to see how many N-words he could put together in one sentence. And um, one of the women had a bowl of chili. And she got PO'd enough that uh, she dumped the chili on his head. But what happened was that all the kitchen help at Central was black, as you would expect. And they applauded. It shocked the living you know what. And there is the origin story of Joe Rogan. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> um, so, uh, <laughs> that was funny. I had a, let me ask you this question. This is, I, I have two questions, and then we'll, we'll take questions from the audience. I know there are microphones somewhere. Yes, in the back, back there. Uh, when you look out today, and particularly in the South, you see that uh, many, pla many times, many places, schools are still very much segregated. Um, kids in this country are punished because of the zip code you're born into. You know that down south. You, you, got the black, you still have black schools and white schools, although you don't necessarily have uh, true uh, de facto segregation. How does that make you feel when you, when you, and you still see the lack of resources between, particularly the lack of resources between yeah. um, well, black schools and white schools? I think the resource issue is, is the first problem uh, that we need in uh, school systems uh, more teachers of color uh, that uh, students, young students need to see Achievers, I mean, they see what LeBron does, but they can be LeBron. And uh, the, the question is, how do you transfer this energy to succeed? Um, and to me, that's really our, our challenge. Forget about whether they're white students there or not. That brings me to my question. So this, this is, and I'm sorry, because I've always, and you're no better, you're, you're the best person to answer this question. This is hindsight. It's complete hindsight. But was Brown the correct solution to the problem? Meaning, should the struggle or fight have been over resources? or integration, believing that if you got the resources, integration would have eventually come? Well, it's, it's because... That is, and I, I ask that with all due respect to those individuals who fought an entire struggle to integrate schools. That the integration of the schools was the shortest route to the, to the resource issue. And that uh, otherwise, <laughs> they didn't want to give up the resources, <laughs> and they were going to hang on to it. And, and, and as far as, as our communities, our communities knew we were being shorted. <laughs> yeah. I mean, my, my aunt was a teacher at the high school. 
She was head of the guidance counseling. She knew that she didn't get the kind of support from the school board that Central got. And that if you look at what we're struggling with today, it's still a resource question. Very much so. And you know people who allocate the resources, they shortchange us all the time. So the question is, was Brown the right, the right route? Maybe there was a shorter way. But between Thurgood Marshall, Charles Hamilton Houston. Uh, I'm going to trust them any day of the week. <laughs> hey, you got to go with your winners. <laughs> If, if, if I want a three-pointer at, at the end of the game, I want somebody who can Don't shoot. Don't throw it to me. Throw it to Steph if that's yeah. the choice. I mean, if it's me so. and Steph Curry, just give it to Steph. I might hit it, though. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> you might get lucky. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but this, was, this was a strategy that they had been wrestling with for a long time. And I, I still think that it's a resource issue that we ought to be fighting for and not, not quibbling. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I wholeheartedly agree. Uh, we'll take some questions. And let me just, just, I know that we're a very educated group. Questions end in question marks. So if you can please ask a question when you stand up, that would be uh, quite, quite helpful. Thank you. Um, you mentioned the issue of uh, resources. Uh, at the time of your attempted uh, integration, uh, the resources were at the um, school. Uh, I have had an opportunity to visit um, uh, Little Rock Central uh, since then, um, a marvelous structure. Um, did those resources remain? Um, because the student body um, that was attending there, uh, the Caucasian student body, uh, remained away for a period of time. Um, and what uh, resources are there now, um, long after the integration? Well, Central is still regarded as one of the best public high schools in the country. Uh, they maintain the science, the technology, uh, languages, literature. It, it's a um, uh, still top-notch place. Um, and, and I think <laughs> I've pointed out many times that any outcoming high school senior that says he or she was a student at Little Rock Central High School, you get high recognition by uh, the uh, uh, admissions people. So I, 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 um, I, I think in answer to your question, it's, it's still about resources. It's about whether you have enough um, you know, science labs to, for everybody to be involved, or is it that you have so few that you, uh, you can't spread it around? I think that uh, resources just cuts across all the lines, and that uh, we have to be able to see that we're being shortchanged, demand adequate resource support and it's, and it's not a question of the teachers I mean it's the other thing it's the, it's the computers it's the the, the uh, equipment I mean if you're going to be the next Spike Lee you got to have a camera and uh, all of that is something that uh, is still missing in the equation Last time I went to, just to talk about the type of school that uh, Little Rock Central is, I, we were talking about it upstairs. The last time I was there, I was actually a guest of, of uh, the um, 
42nd president of the United States and his amazing wife, and it was uh, Bill Clinton, Tony Blair, and George W. Bush, all in the same at a, at a high school. At a high school. So it was it was decently surreal uh, that that Little Rock Central still had that place of lore that you had uh, two presidents and a prime minister just kind of chilling in downtown Little Rock. Uh, next question. Yes, ma'am. What advice would you give to us today uh, for what is the best way to try and get people to to realize that we need to focus on the resource issue? and focus on the people that we are electing to get them to focus on getting the resources to our schools. I'm not sure I understood. Oh, she was talking about how do we, I mean, there's two, two parts to the question. How do we get people to focus on the fact that this is a resource issue? And the second is how do you hold our elected officials accountable to understand that they are doing the job of securing those resources? I think I surmised that pretty good. Well, I think you have to spend some time pointing out to elected officials where the resources are. Um, that, uh, secondly, you have to be willing to have somebody who's going to be the provocateur and not the uh, not to support all the time and. Uh, and then thirdly, um, I mean, this, you make up a lovely picture as an audience. Uh, I know you wanted to see uh, Mr. Sellers, but uh, <laughs> if this number of people will come out to talk about resources, mm -hmm. we should go the next step. And how, how do we get an implementation activity going? Um, I would hope that uh, there's enough of a willingness to uh, to support a program that uh, uh, would come out of this group and uh, examine uh, public education in w Wilmington and Philadelphia and who the hell is Ernie Green to come into Wilmington and tell them what to do? But it, 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 we hear about the grassroots of the book burners, the, the Neanderthals, all of that, and they get a lot of coverage. We never hear about people who provide scholarships, send some kid off to some school that nobody thought he would ever get into uh, she and I think we got to reverse the the uh, re reverse the information uh, prove that uh, you can do physics and basketball at the same time mm -hmm. that's a good question and organizing is always the key right but there's a lot of exhaustion out, out there, and I think we have to be willing to understand that. And then elected officials also have to give you a reason to come out and vote. Um, we have to have more conversations about, about that as well. Questions? Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Green, uh, you were probably one of the, um, spent the least amount of time at uh, Central being the first to graduate. And I wanted to know, because you have this uh, visceral atmosphere you had to study and work and turn your work into the teachers, did they give you or the rest of the uh, uh, Little Rock Nine a hard time in terms of what they would consider a good paper or a good ex uh, um, uh, assignment that was turned in versus just marking it down just because you were who you were? Well, I think it was, it was probably all of that. Uh, the uh, we'll this fall we'll celebrate our 65th anniversary mm. of Little Rock, wow. and uh, uh, I think you know that all the teachers that uh, intersected with us 
have either gone on to glory or close to glory. Uh, the um, the the uh, attempt by an, a few white students when we were there was to be helpful. I, I had this physics course and uh, uh, I had one student who was uh, my lab partner. He got, his family got uh, calls in the middle of the night, the business got threatened and all of that. And he was willing to stand up to uh, be of support to me. And I think there's not enough of that that's known around in many of these communities. People who really did have to suffer the hard times. Uh, we need a lot of more energy displayed on those individuals. Um, my hope is that this we got the 65th anniversary, uh, and it's you know. It's great for us to get all this recognition, but uh, there's a whole generation coming behind us, and we need to give them some uh, lessons on how to maneuver, how to hold politicians responsible for change. Mm -hmm. uh, what it is, how do you study? I, I, I had a uh, roommate in, at, in college who gave me a couple of lessons in, in studying that you, you really got, if you go to the library, you got to go to the library. If you uh, uh, assemble a group of friends who have a study group, you got to be there on time. There are a number of things, techniques and I believe information we got to figure out how to transfer to the next generation and maybe tonight is a place to start. Uh, I have a quick question. Um, I'm reminded of uh, the vice principal there, um, Elizabeth Huckabee. She wrote, she had a copious diary, a daily account of um, your experience there. Um, was, she, um, was she an ally? Was she a support to the, to the students there? Well, she was she was keeping a diary. <laughs> uh, she probably, uh, you know, compared to some of the support. We she had. wasn't as bad as the other white folks. <laughs> yeah, it was. He, he's, he's he's right. It was a degree of uh, of her support, but uh, I think the you know the. The real supporters, uh, and there were a few, uh, paid a real steep price for probably being close to us. And you could, that, I'm sure the this, uh, this same story exists here in Wilmington, mm -hmm. that uh, people who toughed out the uh, desegregation, they were called in lovers and you know and and they paid a price for it oh sorry i see a couple hands i see two over here and two um, over here i don't know if you can hear me um I'm so, i apologize if i seem kind of nervous but i'm young and i grew up like learning about you so this right here is like a really really like i don't know what's going on right now so um <laughs> As a young melanated person, I'm 19, I might be the youngest person in here. Um, I know what it's like to go to a predominantly white school, but we're so-called free. So I know the emotional toll it took on me as a young person having to deal with certain things, you know, being melanated, growing up melanated, and then going to a school where, like, I was deemed as, like, just me, my natural expression of self was weird. So I wanted to ask you, as a person who was dealing with segregation, living in segregation, how did it, like, how do you feel like it affected you or affected your peers growing up having to go to school with white children and them not accepting you? Because I know what it feels like being young and having to, you know, 
That's a brilliant question. I was actually, that was one of the questions I had written down. Talk about the emotional scars that she's talking about and anything that you learn that can help young people cope because, you know, it, it sucks when people don't give you the benefit of your humanity. And I know that you live through that. And we want to make sure that young people have the tools necessary to not just, I'm tired of black folk having to survive, but we have the ability to thrive. Well, I think the, uh, you start out with the goal of doing more than just surviving. That uh, you would figure out how to, the mechanics of it are put together. Um, the question, though, for those of us, the nine, I'm sure that uh, you have sleepless nights. You uh, remember that you could have been at at the movies uh, at a dance or something rather than having to figure out how you're going to create this myth. And, and I think, you know, part of it is success doesn't mean you have to, you have to paint yourself white. Success means, you know, you, you can support your, your, who you are and try to use it as a building block for where, where you're going to be next. I mean, I, uh, I've had great opportunities, and some of them fell flat. One of the greatest opportunities I had was being part, when you talked about President Clinton, he put a delegation together to go over for Nelson Mandela's presidency and my whole life I never thought Mandela would get out of jail and to go to South Africa and be part of the official delegation with people like Colin Powell and Jesse I mean I was, I was a lower light still a light <laughs> but to think that uh, that I, I could witness Nelson Mandela being sworn in as a, as a president of Free South Africa, it, it, it just never seemed that was going to be possible. And yet, I witnessed it. And I think that we have to put together opportunities and witnessing. Uh, activity f for a generation coming on. Maybe, maybe that means kids that are in kindergarten. Uh, it was a couple themes, but I'm, the producers are telling me. No, I don't blame it. <laughs> in, in front of the open crowd. I know y'all got a bunch of questions, but it's his fault. <laughs> that's southern hospitality see I told y'all this ain't really that's okay uh, I know we got one right here and then we're going to do my gentleman over here and then we'll, we will wrap but we'll be here for a moment afterwards right. see right. yes. I, just, I just have a very quick uh, question Mr. Green just a follow up on that excellent question from that young woman um, in your darkest moments mm. what gave you the strength to hold on I mean I'm, I'm sure I'm a black woman, I work in corporate America, and I've had some dark moments, but I know they can't compare to your dark moments. What gave you the strength to hold on? How did, what kept you guys going? Well, uh, I think you, you, had, you had to have a belief that, that you had a uh, support system behind you. And that was uh, my, my mother and some neighbors. That was a, a brick mason who lived across the street from, from us, Harvey Jackson. And I worked one summer with Mr. Jackson. Now, being a neighbor and working for him, two different things. I mean, 
he could bust your you know what. But he was producing jobs. And he was also the person who had a uh, uh, organized the people in the neighborhood to be on the lookout for anybody who was trying to bring harm to our house. And I, I don't think enough of those stories have been told because it's a belief that, you know, out of the goodness of somebody's heart, they ended racism. Probably not. <laughs> I mean, we're still struggling with uh, all these vestiges, and mainly they discount us as not being equal. So that the question the young lady raised here, we, yeah, a lot of people paid a price. They're probably emotionally scarred. Every now and then you wake up in the middle of the night, you want to fight somebody. <laughs> but all that was done because you believed you were making a, a better path for the next Next generation. I mean, it's all the imagery about the Underground Railroad. All of that, we can finally, you know, focus on. But we're still dealing with the Underground Railroad. We're trying to pass on to the next generation that you can make it. You can succeed. You can accomplish, uh, and that we need to know about it. And I think on the Bakai, on the, with with your production activity, we need more stories. I, I, I know I get blamed for everything. I, I've just worked it. <laughs> <laughs> we need we need more stories, and they should be coming from lots of places. And the story is that you're not weird for being in the library on a Monday or a Tuesday night talking to some old guy about something that happened over 65 years ago. We got stories. We need to bring them to the front. and We need to convince this next generation that they can build on these stories and give us a path to how we're going to get over. One more, one more question. Good evening, Mr. Green. Um, my, my question is, as, as you can see, I'm a highly uh, pigment, pigmented young man. And, uh, <laughs> and um, I, I, I go to a PWI. I'm actually a senior. And I'm going through the same problems you're going through or, or you went through. And my, my question to you is what, were, what, what, what is advice you would give a young black male today? Well, I, I think that it's a different world from when I was growing up to today. Some of it's good. <laughs> Some of it probably is not so good. But you got to be willing to uh, fight for change, be different, be in the library instead of, you know, on the corner. You got to continue to push the... Uh, uh, the authorities, we got to find something between us and police and gun violence. We got to figure out how we finally make it so that young people feel safe. 
Uh, my hope is that what we did at Central is a, a beginning, not an ending. And while, you know, I, I'm like the... I like the awards and all of that and the recognition, but that has to be bestowed upon you, not me. Um, I have an opportunity to hang out with President Mandela. I'm going to, I'm going to take it because I admire him and he's somebody he told someone once that our story in Little Rock was part of the stories that uh, allowed him to spend the 20 yard years in prison. And we got lots of people playing, paying a price so that we can go on to the next step. I, I don't have a magic wand, I wish I did. All I know is that when that decision came down in May 17th, 1954, they said it's gonna change the South forever. I said, good, because the South needs to be changed. <laughs> and I was a teenager. And I didn't realize how blessed I was that had a support team that believed I could, uh, I could think that way. So my answer is, I think this is an opportunity for us to think bold, think how we can achieve and how we can lay a building block for the next person to step on and move on to Mars. I said Mars because either we're going to put the Neanderthals on Mars or they're going <laughs> to... We got to go somewhere. <laughs> so, but in all seriousness, it is about building blocks. I mean, 1619 is a number. And maybe when the first enslaved person came on the shores of, of South Carolina. We started this thing. I think. But we got to build on that, not step back go forward and I think I, I, I like the motion that we're moving forward. Well, you know, I always tell folk that every ounce of change we've ever had in this country is because of the blood, sweat, and toil of, of many black folk. Um, you know, you wouldn't have the Civil Rights Act and Voting Rights Act if you didn't have the Edmund Pettus Bridge and the struggles of Megger and Emmett, etc. You didn't, you wouldn't have Fair Housing Act without the assassination of King in South Carolina, we wouldn't have taken down a Confederate flag without Mother Emanuel and those nine people who were murdered in that church. Um, it always takes that pain. And the last two of the last questions from young people in here kind of talked about that pain and the lasting effects of it. And the, these individuals like Mr. Green, we see them today. We can't discount that anxiety, those sleepless nights, and the impact it had not just on them, but everybody around them. Imagine one, you know, wondering if there's going to be a cross burned on your yard or firebombed or if you have a young relative who will be the next Emmett Till. This was the existence of many black folk during that time and still some today. So I always want to say that I think it's good at this particular time where we rededicate ourselves to understanding there's nothing irredeemable about this country. We just have to fundamentally reimagine what she looks like. Um, that we end this conversation where we begin, which is to simply say thank you. And thank you to Mr. Green. Thank you to the other eight that stood with him. And thank you to all of those whose stories go untold.
we come from a people of griots, and we have to begin doing a better job of sharing our story, because if we don't, who will? So thank you all, and God bless you. Good night. That was fun. We need to take this one. Yeah, we, we, we. <laughs> I like it. Great question. Yeah. Hey, listen. But all kidding aside, we, we may be up for uh, another medal. I, I want to talk to you about it. We'll see. We'll see you next week for our night with uh, living legend Pam Greer. He's he's not he's not signing. Yeah.